Welcome, welcome to the September 21st meeting of the Rotary Club of West Jacksonville. We are so glad you're here. And Zoomers, we're glad you're with us as well. Our invocation today is going to be given by Meredith. And, our, um, and then Judy Matheny will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Meredith? Please bow your heads with me. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Bless, we beseech thee, all who, following in his steps, give themselves to the service of others, that with wisdom, patience, and courage, they may minister to his name to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy. For the love of him who laid down his life for us, in Jesus' name, amen. Great, thank you so much, Meredith and Judy. Okay, she's just barely had a chance to sit down, but I'm gonna ask Gigi Carroll and Allie L Allison to come forward. Let me up here. So it's a special day in a club when you get to introduce somebody new to your membership. And that's what we have. I have the privilege of doing today. So um, with me up here today, I have Allison Loreza. Let's do it right. I've been bad at butchering names lately. So I apologize if I did. And her sponsor, Gigi Carroll. And um, I'm just so thrilled to welcome you to our club today. Um, as a former member, in, in a younger age of our inner of, an, of an interact club, I know you're very familiar with Rotary and what Rotary means. But just to refresh your memory, your memory by becoming a part of our club, you also become a member of a larger organization, a worldwide organization of over 1.3 million Rotarians. It's truly a family. We consider ourselves a family, and you will now be a part of our family and the larger international family as well. We're dedicated to the ideals of service above self, which we proudly display on our banner. We were founded in 1905 by Paul Harris in Chicago. We have over 33,000 clubs in 166 countries. So as you are well familiar, you're one of, one of many trying to do good in the world. We are an organization of business and professional people in many, many different occupations and careers. And we work together to try to fulfill this year. Our theme is Imagine Rotary. So we're trying to bring peace to the world and serve through our service through Rotary. We consider um, our membership here in our club to be a privilege, but also a responsibility to give back to our community and the larger global community. And we welcome you to that, that membership, that family, and that organization. So Welcome to our family, now your family. So if you would please join me in welcoming Allison to our club. So we presented Ali with her pen and her red badge of courage is what I call it. And I'm going to ask um, Gigi and Ali to say a few words. Um, thank you, everybody, for receiving me with open arms to this um, family. Um, I know I come from Interact, which for me was um, a beautiful chapter in my life because we were also a small family in high school, but we were a family. 
And I have really, like, really good memories about um, helping my community with my fellow interacts. And I think we still, a couple of us still keep in touch. Um, but I'm very, very um, happy to be part of um, this beautiful chapter and to start a new chapter with you guys in my life. Um, and I would love to help with Interact <laughs> as well. I know that you guys, um, a lot of you don't know that much about Interact, but it, it's, um, it's a chapter in high school. And, you know, for, for high schoolers, it's, it's, it's when you start realizing what you want to do um, in your future with your life. And I think for me, I already knew what I wanted to do in my life and trying to help my community. It's something that I have always like been passionate about. And I just want to say one quote um, and close it with that. Uh, give me one second, if I can pull it up. <laughs> so Paul P. Harry said, Rotarians are very much more favorable, disposed towards action than they're, they're towards words. And I think I'm one of those people. I like to be like put myself in action more than I can speak sometimes. So thank you. <laughs> I mean, she ended with quoting Paul Harris and she was an interactor. How cool. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, we have some pop ups. I didn't tell Ed Lombard I was going to do this, but Ed Lombard, where are you? Football and football. After last week's performance, hopefully you said that last time, but I appreciate you guys signed up. We look forward to your work with the district. Uh, Great. Thank you, Ed. And Lee Davis, did you want to do a pop up about the social? We'll sign up on that DB. Okay. Oh, Great. Thank you, Lee. And also a reminder that we will be attending the Blue Angels Air Show on October the 21st out at the Naval Base. And um, our members, the attendance is free. If you want to bring a guest, a spouse, a whoever you'd like to bring. Tickets are $50 and you can reserve a spot there through DACDB. And Ike, where's Ike? Ike has a pop-up for us, Ike. Great, thank you. And just a reminder that we have two service opportunities coming up. Um, the first, there's a sign up sheet on your table for an opportunity for us to work with members of the Southside Rotary Club on their service day at Rethreaded. And that date is September 29th, and the hours are 1.30 to 4.30. And you can sign up um, on the sheet on your table. And also, um, a reminder that the Jacksonville Diaper Bank is collecting diapers next week for their diaper drive during National Diaper Week. So you can bring diapers here to the meeting and then we'll get them over to the Jacksonville Diaper Bank. So diaper um, drive next week, you can bring diapers here to our meeting. Any other pop-ups? Gigi?
great. So another opportunity for service, then this one geared specifically to our youth, which I won't go on and on about how important that is. Okay, any other pop-ups? All right, with that, I will ask Carl Dawson to come up and give us our family of Rotary report. Carl? How's everybody doing? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could you? <clears throat> All right, from today's national news, um, our commander in chief was recently on CBS show 60 Minutes and it was heard he asked how long the show was. In other news, in other news, Donald Trump has come out with a new candy bar. It's incredibly rich, but it has no taste. All right, uh, news of the family. Please keep Larry Daly and his wife in your prayers and thoughts. They're having a difficult time right now. Um, now for some better news. Amber and I bought an e-bike from Charlie at Lakeshore Schwinn yesterday, and it was an amazing experience. If you need a new bike or have, need your old one fixed, go see Charlie. And even better, Charlie, this weekend, will be celebrating his 40th wedding anniversary with his wife. And um, as for myself, my one-year-old niece is, uh, has her birthday today, and I asked her father what she wanted for her birthday. He said she wanted a 2022 GT3 Porsche. And I said, well, what else would she like? And he said, maybe a wooden toy from Target. So I think she's going for the second one. Um, any announcements, bar mitzvahs, weddings, announcements from any, anybody here in the group? Not a thing. All right. Uh, birthdays this week. Randy Thornton, tomorrow, he turns 46 years old. Uh -uh. Clayton Riley's birthday is the 25th. He'll be 97 years old. I think the light bulb was invented then, wasn't it? That was a long time ago. Uh, Phil Voss, also, his birthday's on the 25th. Vince Coyle, I know you're here. Stand up, Vince. Vince's birthday is the 26th. And so is James McDonald. All right, now I've got a little story for you. A man wakes up in the hospital bandaged from head to foot. The doctor comes in and says, ah, I see you regain consciousness. Now you probably won't remember, but you were in a huge pileup on the freeway. You're gonna be okay. You'll walk again and everything, but your Mr. Happy was severed in the accident and we couldn't find it. The man groans, but the doctor goes on. You've got $9,000 in insurance compensation coming, and we now have the technology to build a new Mr. Happy. They work great, but they don't come cheap. It's $1,000 an inch. The man perks up. So the doctor says, you must decide how many inches you want. But this is something you should discuss with your wife. If you had a five inch before and go to nine inches, she might be put out. If you, have a nine, if you had a nine incher before and you decide only to invest her five incher, she might be disappointed. It's important that she plays a role in helping you make a decision. The man agrees to talk it over with his wife. The doctor comes back the next day. So have you spoken with your wife? The man says, yes, I have. And has she helped you make a decision? He says, oh yes, she has. He says, well, what is your decision? Asked the doctor. We're getting new granite countertops. And that's my report. Thank you very much. I'm not sure what to say after that. Thank you, Carl, I think. Um, Sergeant at Arms, Carter, Carter Rosenblum is gonna introduce our guests and visiting Rotarius, Rotarians and give us a history moment. Carter. Thank you, President Sean. Glad to follow up after that one. Uh, my moment in history today cannot be more timely because the topic of it is uh, 
uh, inappropriate jokes and questionable comments made early on in Rotary. Apparently, this isn't something we suffer from nowadays. Uh, it was from the title chapter at Rotary's second year, 1906. And uh, parts of the chapter I found interesting. It said, at the very beginning of Rotary in Chicago, each meeting started with a roll call where a member stood up, said their name, what type of business they were in. The purpose principally to impress upon each other's members business so that the exchange of business might thus be stimulated. After membership grew, having people do all this took way too long. So they resorted to each member just doing a rehearsed statement of their business to give in front of the group. Well, as this led on, it just turned into people telling jokes, pranks, and uh, it made good fellowship and made the meetings light and enjoyable. Also that year, Rotary started having guest speakers come to the meetings. This is how singing became a thing in Rotary, which I guess didn't last because I've never sung here in a Rotary group. But during an early 1906 meeting, an out-of-town guest speaker was called upon to say a few words. As he began to talk and tell a story, a Rotary member, Harry Ruggles, immediately recognized the tale and how it ended. Knowing the punchline was in questionable taste and designed to offend, he quickly jumped to his feet and yelled, let's sing. This put an abrupt end to the speaker's antidote. This started two trends, one which didn't last, which was if there was ever a lull in the meeting, Harry would stand up and say, let's sing, or everybody sang in tone. The number two, which I found the most interesting, was that uh, after he interjected in the speaker, the speaker was embarrassed by Harry's action. Then and there, the unwritten rule was established that rotary meetings should always be conducted in a manner allowing a lady to attend without blushing. This concludes my moment in rotary history. So, I'll leave the other joke I had for next week. Unfortunately, do we have any guests today? Did anybody bring a guest? So we have no guests. So I'd like for Dane Jensen to come introduce our speaker today. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome Dr. Lyell Steiglitz, a member of the American Neurological Association known for her approach to treating the whole patient as opposed to just the disease. Dr. Steiglitz has extensive research experience, having been published in numerous urologic journals and textbooks. She is well-trained in management of both benign and malignant conditions of prostate, bladder, and the kidney. Dr. Steiglitz has expertise in open, laparoscopic, and robotic procedures. Dr. Steiglitz graduated from JU in 2006 with a bachelor degree. She went on to receive her medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, next to do her graduate work, finishing with a Master of Public Health at Emory University. Then she completed her residency at Dartmouth Medical School, located in Lebanon, uh, New Hampshire. Fellow Rotarians, please give a warm West Jacksonville round of applause for Dr. Steiglitz. You guys planted that joke in that history thing, because then you have a urologist coming up. I don't really know what we're going to get into today. <laughs> can I take this one off? Okay. okay. I want to stand over here so I can see my slides, because I know what I'm saying, but I don't like giving Joe control, so I'm going to stand here to control him a little bit. Um, I am a urologist. I have a lot of very dirty jokes. I don't plan on telling any today. Um, my eight-year-old son tells all of his friends that I'm a penis doctor, not a real doctor. So one day the government's going to knock on my door, but they haven't yet. But the, the last time I spoke at a Rotary Club, um, I was invited to talk about urinary incontinence, leaky bladders, and sexual dysfunction. And the audience was a little different, and all their questions at the end were about prostate cancer. So I tailored this talk a little bit and just called it Urology 101, just kind of a little 20-minute whirlwind of what I do, what I see. 
I'm at MD Anderson, but I don't only treat cancer patients. I treat anybody. Um, so don't let the name of that fool you. Most of my patients don't have a cancer diagnosis. Um, so let's get started. All right. When you think about a urologist, we treat kidney stones, sexual function, sexual dysfunction, leaking bladders, leaking urine, prostate troubles, bladder troubles, fertility for men. I don't do female fertility, but I do a lot of vasectomies, especially with the recent Roe versus Wade stuff. Kidney cancer. Joe's going a little slow. Bladder cancer. This is everything you would see a urologist for. I'll segue into prostate cancer just for a little bit. This is a tremendous topic, but we'll just cover it in about three slides. In 2017, which is where I have the most recent data from, there were over 200,000 newly diagnosed cancer or prostate cancer cases in America, 30,000 deaths. The diagnosis rate is a little over 100 for every 100,000 men. And the death rate is about 19 for every 100,000 men diagnosed with it. 3.1 million men in America currently living with a diagnosis of prostate cancer, and it is the number two cause of cancer-related deaths. Every 15 minutes in America, there's a new diagnosis of prostate cancer. That's why I get a lot of questions about this. This is a really interesting map. This is um, the darker blue is more um, population diagnosed with prostate cancer. So those states, I don't know if they have older populations. I don't really think so looking at this map, but it's just, there's lots that goes into this, but it's, there's an interesting geographic pattern with prostate cancer. And I just like showing this slide. And then the next slide, shows that um, in Florida, prostate is the most common cancer diagnosed in men, and it is the second most common cause of cancer-related death. And Florida does have a much older population when we look at other states. This is a statement from the United States Preventative Services Task Force. How you check for prostate cancer is with a PSA. It's a blood test. You also can check by doing a rectal exam, having someone feel your prostate. Um, most guidelines don't recommend doing that anymore. A lot of doctors still do it out of habit. I tend to not do it because if I find cancer with my finger, then it is already advanced and your PSA is going to show it. So we have a lot of other tools. I actually don't do that because patients don't love that. They don't like coming to see me. I tell them I have tiny fingers, but it doesn't make it any better. Um, so PSA is really what I do. There's lots of different blood tests, but there's no blood test superior to a PSA. So if your urologist or your primary care orders something that's not PSA, it might be because they were trained to do that. They were trained to look at it, but I look at your PSA and I plot it on a graph and that's what I look for. Um, we haven't had anything come out that's newer or better. Um, when you talk about checking for prostate cancer, the average risk, so someone with no family history, we start screening at age 55. We stop screening at age 70, but that's not a hard and fast rule. What that is, is by the time most men are 70, they have other health issues. And the last thing you need is for someone to tell you a prostate cancer, because if you have it when you're 70, it's probably not going to cause you any harm. If you have it when you're 55 to 69, that's a nice window to treat it. Um, and we, I screen after age 70, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's not that we don't care about you once you turn 70. It's just that at that point, do you want to worry about prostate cancer? You probably don't need to, if it hasn't bothered you until then, it's probably not going to bother you. So when you hear that number, that's what that's referring to. Um, so around age 70, I have plenty of patients who get treated in their eighties. You know, it, it's always patient dependent. Um, we look at other medical issues, life expectancy, that sort of thing. And that's just what these statements are saying. When we talk about prostate cancer survival, this is the good news. When it's caught early on, five-year survival is almost 100%. So that's why it is important to get your PSA checked. If you have a family history, talk to your doctor about starting younger. Um, and prostate cancer is worse in African-Americans. We're still studying this and looking into it. Uh, but there's a big population in Jacksonville that doesn't get screened at all and they come in when it's too late. So I really push for that. If we catch it when it's more advanced, five-year survival is down to about a third. So it is important, 55 to 70, to get your PSA checked. Um, our next topic, I believe, is sexual dysfunction. It should become yellow when he gets there. Yeah, okay. 
Um, MD Anderson brought me on to head up their men's sexual health program. So I did a lot of spe specific training in this um, in residency. I published a lot of papers and I won an award for the best penile implant paper for one of my papers. Uh, I sent it to my dad. He was very proud of me. <laughs> he never got any soccer trophies, but I can write about penis implants. Um, <laughs> No one's, you know, this is an awkward topic, not for me, because I do this all the time, but unless someone asks you, you're probably not really going to volunteer this information. So when you walk in my door before I even meet you, you have filled out a form, you can hit the next button. And I ask you all about your erections and what you do with them and how they work. And then I meet you. So we're going to, you know, have a little icebreaker before you even come in to see me, if this is what you're coming to see me for. And the thing is, if, if no one asks you, you're probably not going to talk about it. And it's not just, if you say, oh, I'm 80, it doesn't work anymore. That's not really true. There's something going on because it's supposed to work. It's not supposed to stop just because you're becoming more mature. Uh, next slide. So it's actually very, very common. The percentage is about one in five American men over age 20 have some form of erectile dysfunction. And when you hit age 40, it's over half of men. So you are not alone in this. About 39 million American men have a diagnosis of erectile dysfunction. Uh, if you've been in the military, you get 100% service connection for having that on your diagnosis list. It's just a tip for benefits. <laughs> um, the other side of this is women. So you see all the commercials for men. No one really talks about it in women. The number is about 40% for some sort of sexual dysfunction in women. And that's very underreported. Urologists in the last five years are really pushing to get this, to get more research, to do more studies in this. The problem is it doesn't make money. And so medicine, unfortunately, the bad side of it is about money. Um, but this is something I also focus a lot on in my practice because it's, um, it's very important. This does increase with age because as women have hormonal changes and lose their estrogen, then they have more sexual dysfunction. There are many, many treatment options for men. For women, there's like two, so. Um, I have a little history lesson. This is a Russian plastic surgeon slash urologist. He is credited with doing the first surgery for erectile dysfunction. This was done in the 1930s. So men have been trying to fix this for a very long time. He took pieces of rib cartilage and some sort of rolled muscle from the abdomen and put it inside a penis. It didn't really work. Um, but they kept doing this for 30 years until plastics were invented. So you can tell how desperate men are to fix this. We don't do it that way anymore. Um, this is a famous how to not do a urology lecture. I will not be doing this today, but this gentleman invented penile injections. He is a urologist who went to the Las Vegas annual urology meeting and on stage introduced his product by injecting himself and then walking up and down the aisle with his erection. And we haven't been back to, back to Vegas since. These are the real treatments for erectile dysfunction. This is everything that I do in my clinic. Oral medicines, you all know the names of those. Injection medicine, which actually works really well if you can handle the injection. Vacuum devices, suppositories, and penile implants. Suppositories don't really work, but they're on there. This was fascinating to me when I came back to Jacksonville. We didn't have this in New Hampshire. We didn't even have this in Georgia where I did all my training. You can go see fake doctors who will do all sorts of things to your penis. And none of this, there's no data behind any of this. So if you Google erectile dysfunction, like the top 10 hits are all non-urologist run clinics. Um, and if you've been to them and they've worked, congratulations. But I have a lot of patients who come in and tell me they've spent thousands and thousands of dollars doing this stuff. And then they come see me. When you see me, your insurance is going to pay for it. So if your insurance doesn't pay for it, I wouldn't do it. They're putting shockwave therapy, which it might become prime time for urologists. We're not there yet, but it's basically shockwave. It's ultrasound treatment of the erection muscles. And if you have mild erectile dysfunction, this can help you. But that's just one big study we have. So we're still looking into this. We don't really know about that yet. Don't let anyone put stem cells or plasma on your penis, please. It's just ridiculous. Don't do that. Uh, these are the things that our guidelines support and that if you're interested, these are things you can pursue. This is my second favorite surgery to do. Um, this is a penile implant. So when all those things don't work, you can't handle them. If it's time to move on to this, you don't even have to try the other things to move on with this. It's the best way to have a natural erection again, especially after prostate cancer treatment. It is a surgery 
one night in the hospital and it gives you a pump that you just turn on or your partner turns on uh, whenever you're ready. It's not Bluetooth yet, but that is coming. I'm very excited about that. <laughs> uh, 95% of patients are happy with this. 10 years later, 96% of partners. Um, so the joke about the wife, I, I do involve the wives in these uh, conversations because they have to know this is coming. 500,000 men in America have one of these. You might recognize some of these faces. Larry Flint is the CEO of Hustler Magazine. He's published a lot of articles talking about how much he loves his implant. Uh, El Chapo was reported to have one. We will never know, but maybe he did. Paul Pierce, by rumors on some reality shows, has one. Kanye West has had something done. I don't think he has an implant. I don't really know. He's kind of crazy. And then Clint Eastwood on an SNL skit, they made fun of him by whoever was being Clint Eastwood had an implant as the nose. And I think that that's them telling everyone that he has one of these. So uh, he made somebody's day. All right, back to women. We have one option for low sexual drive in women. It's a pill, the little pink pill competing with the little blue pill. It's only for pre-menopausal women and it only improved about 30% of the women with a lot of different side effects. I don't have anyone on this prescription right now, but it is an option, but it just sort of taught me that, you know, the doors are opening for this and we're gonna get farther with this in the next couple of years. I do a lot of estrogen replacement in women, not the whole body, but just locally applied estrogen creams. It is a miracle worker. It doesn't have any effect on breast cancer. It is amazing. Um, pelvic floor physical therapy is wonderful for women. We have that at MD Anderson. And I do have some minor office procedures I do for women that have issues with this. Uh, back to my summary slide that tells me where we're going next, bladder troubles. So. Urinary incontinence is the leakage of urine. There's two types of urinary incontinence. There is, um, okay, well, women are more likely to seek treatment, yeah. Stress incontinence is physical loss of urine with physical stress. You cough and it comes out. You swing a golf club, it comes out. That's stress incontinence. Urge incontinence is a bladder issue where you don't have control of your muscle. You have the feeling, oh, I gotta go and your bladder goes before you get to the bathroom. That's urge incontinence. They're treated in different ways. Um, I do a lot of dietary counseling in my clinic. I had a lady come see me who uh, had urge incontinence all night long. I said, I said, what do you do before you go to bed? She says, well, I drink a bottle of wine. Oh, <laughs> she stopped that and she doesn't wet the bed anymore. So some of this is kind of common sense. Um, there's a lot of medications that I'll go through on some of the next slides and there's some minor procedures and there's some major procedures but you don't have to have a leaky bladder. It's not normal. That's really the bottom line of this. Um, there are, you can go through all these. There are over 14 medicines for your bladder for urge incontinence. That's leaky urine when like, oh, I gotta go. You can't make it to the bathroom. So many medicines in this category. They all can cause dry mouth and constipation, which is really annoying for patients. And all of them except one have been linked to dementia in a really large study. Now. Uh, the study was released about three years ago, and a lot of people haven't really paid attention to it, and I don't know why, but one of the first things I do is I make sure that you haven't been put on any of those medicines when you come to see me, um, except for the one that is not linked to dementia. So it, they are a great option. We have to watch out for side effects, and we have to not put you on the one that might cause dementia. Um, this is a detailed slide about urge incontinence. It's worse with running water, with cold weather, um, different treatments lifestyle, changing your diet, pelvic floor physical therapy is really, really great for this because she can teach you techniques to stop the leakage medicines. And I do a lot of Botox in bladders, insurance pays for it. And what it does is it gets you off your medicine and it sort of paralyzes your bladder muscle. So you hold more urine and you don't, it can't urge, it can't squeeze when you don't want it to, because I paralyze it just like in one area. It's a wonderful, wonderful treatment. It changes a lot of lives. You have to do it about every four months. I have a lot of happy patients on Botox. Stress incontinence, so leakage with physical stress on your pelvis is basically urine falls out. Worse with activity. Treatments are lifestyle, pee twice, sit down, pee again, uh, peeing every two hours. Don't hold it all day if you want to go six hours between using the bathroom. I cannot help you. Two hours is always my goal for you. 
pelvic physical therapy with Kegels is a really great treatment for this if it's mild enough. And then procedures include slings, bulking agents. I'll show you this. This is brand new and it's really exciting and artificial sphincters. Um, Bulkamid is a brand new product I have for women. So it's like what you would put in your lips for lip fillers, but I put it in the urethra. And the next slide is a picture, but it's been in the US for two years. It was in Europe for seven years before that. And um, it is just as effective as a sling. That is a urethra. So that's where the pee comes out and you can see it's open. So when you cough, urine just comes out. This is a female urethra. And then I put Bulkamid in just like four little injections and it shuts it. And the bladder is still strong enough to squeeze around it, but this is five minutes and it is life-changing. It's an amazing new procedure that we have. And this is just an overview for other stuff. And, um, you know, plan your bathroom breaks. Don't hold it all day. Physical therapy. If you can't have surgery or you're not interested, I have lots of other things for men, especially. It sounds kind of crazy, but I do have these penile clamps that are soft. And I have a lot of men that use them actually. And it just keeps the urethra shut. And when you go to the bathroom, you take it off and then the urine can come out. Um, this is my favorite surgery because these patients are so happy. Um, it's an artificial urinary sphincter. So if you've had prostate cancer, you pro and you leak still, this is really what you need. That's usually the only indication to do this because when you have your prostate removed or treated with radiation, it can damage the muscle that controls the release of urine. And um, this is just going through the numbers of that. The artificial sphincter is again, a one night hospital stay, about a two or three hour surgery that gives you a balloon that mimics the sphincter muscle that's been damaged. It is so great for quality of life. You get a pump, you can have two pumps. You can have a penis pump and a sphincter pump. I have plenty of patients with both. Um, and it gives you control over your bladder again. It's just such a life-changing treatment, um, especially, you know, your prostate cancer is gone and then you leak urine. You're not really a happy guy, but this is wonderful. They're easy to use. No one knows it's there. I don't know if we're working on Bluetooth for this or not. I don't think that would be a good idea. 95% um, of patients are happy with their device. 90% would have the surgery again, and 94% would recommend it to family and friends. And I believe we did it all. Okay. Uh, our media lady didn't come, so I don't have cards or anything. I'm very sorry about that, but that's how to find me. Well, uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm now going to come around with the mic. Please wait for me to get over there. Um, I think this is going to be our best Q&A ever. <laughs> Two questions. First, how did you decide on this field? This is what you wanted to practice. And secondly, would you like to join our Rotary Club? <laughs> I think I would get kicked out based on the inappropriate jokes. Um, if, yeah, me and Carl will hang out. Um, if my father or his friends ask me why I joined this, I say it was my last act of rebellion for putting me in Catholic school. Um, but re really why I went into urology, um, my youngest sister has Down syndrome. So I always grew up around doctors and therapists and everything. And I wound up doing my public health degree with patients with spina bifida and they all have bladder issues and they all have urologists. And I thought the field was just so fascinating because you do surgery, but then you still see your patients. It's not like a general surgeon takes an appendix out. And you never see them again. It's a really neat field where I have a lot of continuity. I really follow my patients for lots of things and the surgeries are really fun. Welcome to West Jackson. Thank you for being here. Um, I've heard a lot about the treatment for prostate cancer and that there's, there's more targeted treatment with fewer side effects. Can you talk a little bit about how those patients are treated and what kind of hope there might be for the future? Yeah, the, um, the standard treatments right now are either surgery, taking the whole prostate out or radiation. And radiation will treat the whole prostate and the surrounding areas. Those are the two standards. Radiation has gotten a lot better with our imaging. We can target the prostate. We can target 
the field to deliver the radiation to, but you still have side effects because it's not perfect. Um, there is new local therapy that we've been looking into for over 10 years where if you have one tumor in your prostate, why do we take the whole prostate out? Why can't we just fry that tumor? The problem with prostate cancer is most of the time, it's not just in one place. So it's very select patients who do that. And then a lot of, because a lot of times you have prostate cancer because you've lived long enough to get it. So you might have, you know, a little spot here that we want to treat, but then you'll have other cancer right here. So it's very hard to find the ideal patient to do the local therapy. It's not prime time. We don't offer it in MD Anderson. I think Brigham was doing a lot when I was training and you could go there for it. I don't know if insurance pays for it, but the biggest problem is we don't know how to follow those patients because then there's prostate cancer in other parts of your prostate. And it's, um, I don't know if we'll get there, but radiation is much better than it was 10 years ago. And we're much better at the surgery. We do them robotically now too. So, yeah. What about uh, the proton beam? Is that? We, MD Anderson doesn't have proton. Mm, UF Jacksonville does. Mayo, I think, has proton. I didn't have it in training. It's just another form of radiation. I don't know a ton about it, but I've seen a lot of patients happy with it. I think it's equivalent to radiation. It's very expensive to get the equipment. I think that's why we haven't gotten it yet because other services in town have it. Judy has a question. I have a friend who's in his early 60s. And he's not had good luck with radiation and is facing and was considering the surgery. Okay. And, you know, uh, I wanted to bring his support, but one of the things that he wasn't wanting to do was to close the chapter down on his sexual activity. What would be with those? I mean, let's say, you know, post surgery, what would be available to him? Uh, an implant. An implant is the best option after surgery. The oral medicines, maybe 10% of patients it'll work in. Um, injections, most guys don't like them. Um, an implant is the best way to have a natural return to sexual activity again. And it sounds a little wild having a surgery for that, but they guys are so happy afterwards. It's They're just so happy. Um, and the partners are happy too. It feels very natural to the partner. Any more questions? You got some over here. There you go. I'm assuming the the uh, death rate accelerates once it's spread beyond the prostate. Is that what usually determines whether it's a uh, um, uh, great five year survival rate or a, a poor five year survival rate? Yeah, or if it comes back. So once you've had your prostate cancer treated, your urologist will follow your PSA level. And if the PSA starts to rise after treatment, that's also an indicator of poor prognosis because that means it's somewhere else in your body. Mm -hmm. Brandon. Thanks, Carter. Um, we, I heard a lot about prostate cancer, but what about the BPH stuff? What, what's your favorite BPH surgery? Yeah, that's like a whole nother hour talk. My favorite is the green light laser. Um, the green light laser is outpatient. You go home the same day. It just laser vaporizes prostate tissue that's in the way. A TERP is like urology's oldest surgery. The laser is the 2022 version of a TERP. How do you feel about like things like the Eurolift and uh, the esteem procedures? I've done a lot of lasers after those. Um, Eurolift is basically pinning curtains back. So they you do it awake. I don't do Eurolift. I don't love it. Um, in the office, the urologist put a camera in you and then fire these clips to try to pin the prostate back. But it's only good if you have a prostate size that lets you do that. So I've had to do surgeries after this these clips because the prostate is just too big. They don't work. Ooh. <laughs> um, Two. He wants to know the biggest prostate I've ever seen. Uh, 200 cc's, but just because you have a big prostate doesn't mean it has to be treated. Small prostates cause trouble. 
big prostates cause trouble. I don't recommend any treatment unless it causes you trouble. The steam treatment is resume. Resume is also usually an awake procedure where it's basically like, um, pressure washing your prostate out of the way. It's fascinating. Um, I don't do this yet. I don't love it. You have to have a catheter for a long time afterwards. And men hate catheters, um, because there's no way to control prostate bleeding and it's very vascular. It's very quick, but resume has this guarantee from the company that if it doesn't work the first time, you can do it for free again within two years, which makes me think it's not very good. If the company has to offer you a free retreatment. <laughs> Are there other conditions of the prostate besides cancer that will raise PSA? Yes. Having a big prostate will raise PSA. Um, so if your PSA normal is less than four, if your PSA is five and then six months later, it's five. And then six months later, it's five. That's probably because you have a big prostate that makes a lot of PSA because cancer, this is why I always follow PSA is cancer goes like this. If you graph your PSA but just a big prostate, it's just going to be a little high and it's going to stay like that. We do a lot of MRIs now. If you have a high PSA um, and it's not high enough where we're really worried about cancer, we'll do an MRI. And if the MRI is negative, we can say we can biopsy to make sure, or we can just keep watching this because it's probably because you have a bigger prostate. Prostate infections will also make the PSA rise. Any sort of straddle activity, bicycle riding, motorcycle riding, those things will make your PSA rise. Um, having sex within 24 hours of getting your lab drawn will make your PSA rise. I have lots of guys who they weren't told that and they come to see me with one high level. And I say, okay, well don't do that next time. And then it's normal next time. Um, constipation, if you've had constipation for a few days, cause you know, we check a prostate by going through the rectum. Um, if you've had a lot of constipation and pressure, it'll make your PSA rise. So there are, there are lots of reasons why it can rise besides cancer. Okay. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I always need sticky notes. Let's take them from me. Thank you so much. That was so informative. And I really appreciate the fact that you were able to take us a, a really a pretty sensitive subject and talk about it in a way that I won't say it was humorous, but it was, it made it easy, made it easy to talk about and listen to. And, and she's guys, she's got your number. She's got y'all figured out. So um, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, so thank you everybody that made today's meeting happen, made it a success. Our front table crew, Patty and Stu, Joe, Joe, good to see you back this week. We missed you last week, but thanks for being back. Um, thank you, Stu. Um, was it Stu? Stu was our greeter today, right? Where's Stu? Was out there greeting. Um, Judy and Carter and Meredith, Dane, our Zoomers. We're glad you're with us today. And of course, each of y'all. It's good to see you all. Thanks for being here today on this beautiful day. You could have chosen to be outside, but thanks for choosing to be in here with us. Thanks again to our speaker. Um, a couple of reminders. Um, we're going to have a board meeting about five minutes after we wrap up here today. Next week, our speaker is Nick Morrow, who's the athletic director out at the University of North Florida. Don't forget to RSVP for the air show. Don't forget the sign up sheets on your table. And Jennifer Mask, Mac, excuse me, Mac is going to lead us in the four way test. Jennifer? Great. Thank you, Jennifer. I think I'm just going to close with our theme today. Imagine Rotary. Y'all have a great week. Take care. <laughs>